Hi, Julian. Uh, hey, Henry. How are you doing? Uh, not bad, not bad. Uh, it looks like a, a busy week for um, uh, geek stories, uh, especially if uh, you're interested in uh, free speech and uh, privacy in the Internet. Um, one I wanted to start with, because it's sort of right up my alley, uh, is um, a proposal that the uh, it was the New York Times reported on Monday uh, to essentially revive the, uh, the old crypto wars of the 90s, which I think uh, most of us thought were mercifully uh, settled and dead and that we had uh, wisely decided that uh, trying to uh, uh, mandate back doors into encrypted systems uh, was uh, uh, more trouble than it was worth for various reasons. But, uh, but according to the Times, the Obama administration next year plans to seek legislation uh, that would essentially require uh, providers of Internet communication services. And that doesn't just mean your ISP, but Gmail and, and Facebook and Skype and uh, you know, basically any other online service that has communications functionality uh, to build in, uh, not just to permit access to their systems to the government when they have a court, or of course, you don't need legislation for that, but to build their systems in such a way uh, that they're able to provide the plain text of any kind of encrypted uh, data or communication. Um, and the, the really radical thing, actually, and, and we'll see how this actually comes out when we, we see real legislative text, was that um, it, it also included uh, apparently a requirement that makers of uh, software that facilitates peer-to-peer -peer communication, as opposed to communication routed through any kind of centralized server, uh, would also have to be built with some kind of mechanism for the government to uh, intercept and decrypt uh, those communications, which as far as I can tell, I mean, it effectively says you cannot do any longer really secure peer-to-peer, um, end-to-end -peer, uh, -end encrypted communication, which, uh, you know, obviously uh, is, is, I think, a terrible idea on a number of levels. Um, I, I, one thing I'm actually pretty curious about is that there's a lot of software out there that's provided on an open source basis. Uh, the Tor, the onion routing system yeah. for anonymous secure communication, uh, you know, various other encryption suites that are uh, open source. And so I'm not sure how the law would even apply to those, to those, I mean, it's not like there's a company or uh, even a programmer, it's a bunch of people sort of submitting code. I, mean, I guess, I, mean, I don't know how you would effectively make that work unless you were, you know, essentially willing to declare that software illegal somehow. I'm not sure you'd punish for it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Well, I, uh, I have lots of things to say, but but what's your take? Well, my take on well, this is going to be a problem from the point of view of generating serious argument, because this is, I think, one of those areas where lefties and libertarians agree right down the line uh, that this is, you know, so this is creepy stuff. But the thing that uh, surprises me, and I guess this is where you're uh, getting towards towards the end of that, is just how profoundly stupid. And as far as I can see, unimplementable this proposal is. You know, so if you really are expecting people to uh, to completely regear their, uh, you know, regear peer-to-peer -peer communication systems, and maybe people don't realize how many of the tools that we use every day are based on peer-to-peer. -peer. Skype is one very obvious example. You're basically talking about hundreds of millions or billions of dollars uh, worth of uh, re-engineering that's going to be required. You're talking about a massive, massive regulatory burden, and as you say there's the interesting question of uh, how do you apply this to, uh, to, to, to open source software or to software which is on sort of created on a purely volunteer basis where there isn't any single central actor you can go after in order to enforce uh, your actions. And, uh, it, and this, of course, is a problem that has been faced as of when, when people were trying to get rid of uh, uh, networks like Kazaa or, uh, or other uh, peer-to-peer -peer networks back in the day, and you saw the recording industry introducing a whole bunch of uh, things such as uh, flooding it with bogus files, trying to mm -hmm. overload the overload the network. But this seems to me to be, uh, it seems to be a really problematic thing. And I, I guess my hope is that this is one of those trial balloons which is going to get shot down pretty rapidly. Uh, certainly, I was talking to somebody 
in the FCC yesterday about this, and uh, that person uh, had basically learned, uh, as had that person's colleagues, through reading the story in the New York Times on Monday. So you get the impression that this is something which has been hatched by uh, the more national security uh, focused elements in the government without any real recognition of the kinds of, uh, of basically what they're expecting uh, businesses to do. And I suspect they have no idea of the kind of opposition that this is likely to uh, result in. You know, you look at, uh, for example, I think uh, BlackBerry Research in Motion, the uh, company which runs BlackBerry, is a wonderful example of this because uh, BlackBerry, as was revealed when uh, India started trying to apply similar, similar types of measures to it, but, uh, Research in Motion doesn't actually have the keys to uh, figure out who is communicating what to who. Everything is decentralized. Things are run by the uh, businesses themselves, and so you know you're talking for their for their enterprise uh, yeah, for their it, enterprise servers. Yeah, uh, exactly. Sorry, you're 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 quite right for their enterprise servers. But again, you are you know, you're 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 basically asking businesses to fundamentally redesign software in ways that's going to cost uh, massive amounts of money and in ways that, is that are really, really stupid because the reason that people are using peer-to-peer -peer is because it's a very, very effective and efficient way of solving a lot of uh, complex technical problems and involving getting stuff, getting stuff distributed easily and well. And, uh, and, and my hope is that they're going to encounter a whole lot of pushback from uh, well-connected Silicon Valley firms who just tell you, tell them that this is, uh, this is stupid, this is unworkable, this isn't going to fly. Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, I, I do think this is one of these cases where the, uh, you know, probably someone at DHS or FBI kind of made a wish list or something and didn't, I, I just can't believe that they really sort of thought through the, the, the implications. It's, it is, I think, pretty dispiriting after uh, watching the kind of backlash against the United Arab Emirates and, and the, the Saudi uh, sort of attempts to, to strong arm uh, research in motion that, um, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised, actually. I think there was a New York Times op-ed um, right after that where a uh, former DHS guy, I think it might have been Richard Falkenrath, uh, wrote with sort of, I mean, undisguised envy that these uh, yeah. the authoritarian regimes had this ability to, uh, to impose these kind of mandates. And, it was a quite and extraordinary yeah. um, I mean, but, but, but I, do, I do think you're gonna, they're going to find that kind of pushback because I know, I mean, it was just last week that um, the House and Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, Committees held hearings on reform to the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which is the sort of main law governing um, essentially government surveillance of, of digital networks. And this is, you know, one of these sort of de decades old laws. It was written in 1986. It's got this just incredible tangle of vague categories that, that, that no longer make any sense if they ever did. I mean, they may have made sense at the time, but just utterly inapplicable to sort of the practicalities of how, how people use the internet today. Um, or you know, any of our normal intuitions about, about expectations of privacy. Um, and especially with the sort of rise of, of cloud computing services where data is stored by third parties, a lot of these companies like Rackspace and Salesforce and, and Google and Microsoft and Amazon, Amazon um, we're all, yeah, I mean, we're all saying, you know, we need, uh, you know, stronger protections would be nice, but we need above all you know, some kind of clarity because we are, try, you know, we have uh, businesses that are excited about using cloud services or, you know, just a dozen business reasons I could rattle off why, uh, why outsourcing a lot of your data needs or software and data storage needs to services like that makes sense. Um, but there's a big sort of security concern uh, for, for companies that are, that are potentially, you know, running communications involving corporate strategy or, you know, intellectual property worth millions of dollars. Um, and in particular, I mean, I just thought, I don't know if you saw this, there was a story that came out, uh, I think also last week, about a, an engineer at Google. Yeah. Um, who was one of the, the guys who had, uh, and I'm told there's maybe more of these guys than you'd expect, uh, who really had sort of all access uh, to, to Google systems, including you know, user accounts and, and uh, chats and, and email. And he basically had been using this access to kind of uh, sort of creepily spy on a bunch of teenagers that he was interested in for, for whatever reason. Um, and you know, you've got to think that companies thinking about storing stuff in the cloud are going to look at this and say, well, you know, if, if, if we're storing something that potentially is worth, you know, millions to a competitor, uh, we don't want to risk some disgruntled employee who's looking for a cash out. Um, and so I think, that, you know, the ability for a company to say, even if you're storing stuff not in a peer-to-peer -peer way, in a centralized way on our server, 
um, we can provide end-to-end -end encryption, so the keys at least are with you. You may be using it, uh, you know, here, but the, you know, some of the data at least is stuff that even we can't access. And as I understand it, again, if I'm if I'm reading the proposal correctly, um, the business saying it would be it would be illegal to be able to make that guarantee. Um, yeah. They would have to preserve internally the keys that would let someone at the company um, access the data, which is, I mean, actually a little different from the. Uh, the key escrow proposals from the 90s during those, those crypto wars. Uh, I mean, there's sort of pluses and minuses on both sides. On the one hand, that was the idea there was that the government would have all this big cash of keys, and that was seen as problematic. Um, on the other hand, uh, I mean, so, so this is better from that perspective. The companies are keeping the keys. On the other hand, it does mean the companies are going to have difficulty uh, kind of credibly pledging to, uh, to, to be able to host stuff in a way that, that even their own personnel uh, aren't able to access. Um, well, and anyways, I mean, um, I think it's obviously just sort of huge implications sort of internationally. Um, you know, you start saying uh, the systems have to be built this way. You know, there are lots of governments that, that one, you know, it's going to be harder for companies to turn them down if they've already sort of yeah. capitulated to the U.S., but also just that, you know, if, if the software and the networking equipment that's being sold globally and our services that are being provided globally are, uh, you know, essentially designed for breach, by the U.S. government, then that they're you know, equally breachable by uh, by foreign governments with a with maybe a, a more uh, uh, expansive view of what's uh, criminal or um, you know national security threatening speech. Um, and you know, of course, there's the there's the problem of hackers as well. We've had plenty of cases where surveillance architectures have been exploited by you know outside outside parties. And, and so when you talk about saying not just big phone companies with sort of physical centralized hubs, but thousands upon thousands of programmers and, and online services are all going to have to have their own, their own backdoor capabilities. Um, you know, the idea that, that and, and, you know, and everyone's going to know it. Every hacker in the world knows that there's this backdoor in every, any, every, uh, every system out there. Uh, the idea that that's not a, a security risk is just, just, just baffling to me. Um, <laughs> so I think we're on, we're, we're, we're on uh, uh, I mean, I think that the, one thing this shows is, is just what a bad precedent was set by Kalia, which is in a lot of ways a more narrow and reasonable um, yeah. uh, requirement that, that, that digital phone systems be um, required to, to provide that kind of access. But I do think it shows, I mean, a, a much more general phenomenon here is that whenever technology changes, um, you, know, you get a, a cluster of different kinds of effects. In some ways, it makes it easier for people to protect their own privacy. Uh, in some ways, it makes it possible for the government to do, you know, much more massive uh, surveillance. I mean, you know, you know, mass level data mining or automated filtering of thousands of, of email or voice communications. I mean, just stuff on a scale that would have been unimaginable on old sort of traditional wireline phone networks. Uh, but the the this is I mean, there's a sort of strange ratchet where the government never complains. Well, technology has changed in a way that gives us vastly more surveillance power. You've got to adjust the law to keep the old balance. Um, it's only when some aspect of that change also might make things more difficult. They say, no, 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 we have to preserve, uh, we have to preserve the balance. But it's always, you know, a balance in one direction. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess, uh, you know, this is something. Well, a couple of things. First of all. Uh, one of the uh, ironic results, of course, of the crypto wars of the uh, of the uh, 1990s was that you saw you know, the, you saw uh, individual liberties in certain senses being limited by the uh, widespread act, uh, use of cryptography as, uh, as as businesses began to use crypto as a means of enforcing digital rights management schemes of one sort or another, which I think is something that certainly people uh, did not. Expect uh, there, the, when I teach this in my class, I, uh, I I refer back to this one of those documents that was floating around the cypherpunk mani manifesto, where they talk about uh, cryptography as being like the wire clippers that will basically break the barbed wire around intellectual property, and obviously that didn't happen. But I think uh, here's here's my more general take on this, and maybe. Maybe there's some disagreement here that we can uh, fruitfully uh, get at because I, I think on the basic stupidity of this, we're completely in agreement. It seems to me you've, you've had three major phases uh, in, over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. First was the uh, crypto wars, which really is a, a war where you see government uh, seeking to try and preserve the, uh, sort of the 
all kinds of ways that they did have to uh, to to, to, to uh, break into people's communications. Uh, uh, you know, so before, before uh, in the in the days before cryptography was uh, widely accessible, before it became an everyday tool that people could use, and government basically failing to do this in the face of a pretty successfully launched campaign by both business and uh, uh, privacy advocates of one sort or another. Then I think over the uh, next number of years, you see some controversies, which is the stu kind of stuff that I study between the EU and US over the ways in which businesses can uh, use data. And businesses begin to sort of mass become massively more able to um, sort of grab data, to collect data, to, uh, to, you know, so to, to basically keep an eye on what uh, their, their uh, users are doing. And this, uh, this is something that they need for their, uh, for their own personal, for their own benefit, and something where there are very limited uh, restrictions uh, in the United States, uh, somewhat better restrictions uh, if, you, if you like these restrictions in the European Union. Uh, uh, but, but, but then what we're seeing now, I think, is the third phase, where we're seeing government really beginning to realize uh, that this is a massive opportunity for them, that effectively if they can press businesses into their service as uh, digital cops in a certain sense uh, to uh, you know, keep keep an eye on what's happening to uh, protect, you know, so to provide data as necessary, then this provides massive opportunities for them. And, and, and it's a real problem. I think it's a problem in a certain sense. Uh, I think libertarians did not realize on sort of the uh, genie that they were letting out of the bottle when they, uh, when they were uh, pressing for uh, no regulation of this stuff back in the early 2000s. But then on the other hand, the European Union, where I look at it, which used to be extremely privacy friendly, you've seen things such as, uh, it used to be a, a few years ago that European Union privacy legislation requ required telecommunications companies to get rid of their data after a certain period. And instead, of course, the European Union has uh, introduced data retention laws requiring data, uh, requiring the uh, data providers to uh, keep a hold of the records and to provide those records over the last few years. So I'm not necessarily sure that the legis legislative approach would work that much better anyway. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I tend to, I think, prefer in general, um, this is really not the European model, I think, I think, I think uh, a model where, where, you know, really the privacy expectations and data use are, are more negotiated between the user and the, and the, and the, and the site, um, and where you know there's there's a sensitivity to what what users are likely to expect in a given context. Um, I mean, the fact that, that Amazon is using is storing my uh, browsing habits and and using them to make information available to me is sort of so transparent to the user um, that I think I, you know I wouldn't want to burden that with some kind of you know regular opt-in uh, uh, you know mandate or anything like that. I do think I'd like to see what I'd like to see is um, just m more aggressive enforcement of individual sites privacy policies um, and also uh, I mean just uh, software being being tailored to enable uh, users to have more control over their privacy settings you know through the voluntary um, sort of p3p thing never really never really took off but but uh, I still think the, the the right model there is is some kind of machine readable privacy policy where the the browser can be the the choke point I think given given basically the heterogeneity of Privacy preferences and the sort of different level of desirability given on the particular given the particular application of, of, of allowing data to be used in particular ways, um, it just it doesn't make sense to have the choke point um, be either. Frankly, you know, a billion individual opt-ins based on privacy policies that realistically we know nobody does read or ever will read, um, or any you know some kind of broad one-size-fits-all mandate. The the natural choke point for that is is. Uh, is basically a software choke point in, in the browser itself, and so uh, if legislation could, you know, essentially make that more uh, somehow more more likely to be uh, adapted and, and, and cause it to catch on faster, I'd be wary of sort of burdening small sites. But but uh, you know, if there's some way to essentially enable uh, a user-driven sort of choice-driven system through legislation, I'd be uh, a lot more I think uh, friendly to something like that than. Than, than the European approach. Yeah, well, I guess uh, my uh, on, on the one hand, I think the European approach has some real problems, and they're going through a big consultation at the moment trying to figure out how to update the principles. But on the other hand, I think some of the um, European principles seem to me to be uh, 
straightforward ones that actually maximize individual choice. You know, so the uh, basic question, you know, so the basic idea here being that you have to opt into the kinds of uses that are made by, made of your data. I think it's a pretty important idea, and I think it's a it's it's a uh, it's it's a basic right, and it's, a, it's an individual right. It makes sure that businesses cannot and sort of use your data in ways that you didn't uh, sort of basically bargain for at the outset. And I think one of the uh, significant problems that I see with the uh, you know uh, in some ways I find the vision of uh, browsers and uh, of, of browsers and choice being with some sort of regulatory backup being attractive. But a lot of the stuff that we see, of course, these days is on sort of not on the base of the individual website, but it's uh, it's it's uh, advertising companies and others who are sort of gathering data without you realizing it from 20 or 30 different sites that you're browsing and using that to create a more or less complete profile of the kinds of things that you are or are not doing. And and uh, when you see, for example, when you browse a site and you've got five or ten different uh, advertising companies uh, sort of po populating with banner ads, it pretty quickly becomes difficult and maybe plausibly even impossible to come up with some sort of a means where you can uh, use that choke point in a way that's consistent across all of those different companies. So I grant that this, uh, I guess, I like the idea that you're proposing in principle, but in practice well, I suspect that a one-size-fits-all approach for all of its problems, for all of the fact that people genuinely do have different sensitivities here, does provide a better way of dealing with this. Well, I mean, I just I just run AdBlock, but um, so that works. But but um, and yeah. I don't take third party cookies. Um, but I mean, so I think it's true on the one hand that uh, solutions like that. Well, okay, maybe I've got you know maybe I don't take third party cookies and maybe I run AdBlock. But then someone decides to use browser fingerprinting or someone decides or flat, to use those flash cookies. Uh, flash so, cookies, yeah. or, right? I mean, and so you don't. I mean, on the one hand, that kind of arms race is, is I think an unreasonable uh, thing to expect. Um, you know, certainly people who don't work on privacy and, and technology for a living uh, to, to, to keep pace with. Um, on the other hand, I mean, any kind of, uh, well, um, I mean, I think one, I think there's a bunch of problems with, 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 with that kind of solution. One, from, from a sort of uh, privacy perspective itself, I mean, I've seen, uh, you know, proposals for stuff like, uh, you know, kind of FICRA style uh, right to access the information that's stored about you. And my, my, my first thought is, well, doesn't that mean then that they have to store, um, you know, what they're recording in some kind of personally identifiable way, which they might not have any interest in doing um, absent that mandate, and some means of, of I mean, some additional personal information that would allow them to verify that the right person is requesting that information. Um, and then again, of course, you're, you're creating, again, a potential breach, because what if someone manages to, to sort of fool the system and, and get someone else's information? Um, I, I mean, uh, I, you know, especially when you talk about you know, stuff like a do not track list or whatever, again, you're talking about some kind of, sort of centralized mechanism where yeah. um, where all your browsing is basically linked to a single identity. Um, so I, 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 that just seems like a, like a, a balance that's difficult to, to strike. And, and I also think just you know, the sort of re requiring opt-ins for everything, I mean, one, I think, you should understand, you know, the, the, the problem with doing everything by kind of individualized consent is that there's just an enormous amount of friction there, right? I mean, this is the Coase point, right? Like, uh, um, you know, contracts are not, are not costless to make, um, certainly when, when you've got 50 pages of legalese describing the privacy policy. Um, but the same goes, I think, the other way. Um, and so I think there's, you know, there's potential sort of gains left on the table if you make it sort of sufficiently complicated to do this that, that you know, sort of certain kinds of ad revenue models uh, uh, dry up. Um, so I, I, I have, I, also, frankly, as, as someone who spent most of his working career as a journalist, um, you know, there's something that just says, well, God, I'm really glad um, that people I wrote about didn't have, you know, some kind of veto power over, over information I was able to gather about them from, from disparate sources. Um, on the other hand, you're talking about government access. It is clear that these, these sort of data aggregators like ChoicePoint and uh, uh, Axiom are, are you know, co collecting massive amounts of information that the government then contracts use, to acquire yeah. and doesn't end run about around you know what would otherwise be you know something they would have to do through through kind of really cumbersome legal process. Yeah, I, well, I guess uh, the you know sort of as I understand the uh, the kinds of principles that the European Union applies, uh, people can have rights to see what data you collect upon them as a commercial entity. 
uh, if there are full, if there are falsehood contain, falsehoods contained within that data, they have a right to correct them, but they don't necessarily have a right to, uh, for example, uh, prevent you from uh, prevent you from uh, writing about somebody uh, because somebody claims that this is uh, incorrect information. There are. Right, well, I, I, yeah, mean, I understand yeah, certainly the, yeah. The, the yeah the difference between the commercial sort of. Yeah. like that and, 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 and sort of pure speech, and, but, but... And, and, um, I, and I guess I hear you on the, um, on the um, certain commercial uses of uh, people's data uh, and the, um, sort of the, the thing, the certain commercial opportunities being left on the table. Uh, and this, I guess, especially if you're a journalist as you are, this is an issue given the uh, drying up uh, revenue streams that there are for journalism in general. But then, um, sort of in the European Union, you know, so you see a lot less, uh, the de direct marketing industry is a lot less developed. And uh, that, that can be a good thing as well as a bad thing. You uh, don't get the uh, 20 or 30 catalogs uh, that I have to sweep from my, my mail every week. You don't get the same kinds of uh, solicitations purely and simply because people aren't able to swap around uh, lists of uh, likely customers, likely clients. And you know, so you can read that both ways. On the one hand, it means that you maybe maybe somebody offers you something that you in fact want. On the other hand, you don't have to deal with the clutter and the dreck of people basically trying to uh, send you uh, lots and lots of material on stuff that they think you like, and in fact, you do not, you, you have no interest in whatsoever. Well, I mean, I, 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 speaking from from the time when I worked back at uh, Ars Technica, I was someone who was the, I was the Washington correspondent, and, and so I was. Um, uh, I, what we realized as, as the economy began imploding is that um, if the, you know, the people who were writing about uh, Apple, the people who were writing about video games or Microsoft or whatever, um, those articles it was actually pretty easy to do ads for. You writing about Microsoft, you you um, you know you have ads for Microsoft services or accessories, or you're writing about video games, you have um, you know ads for for yeah. fancy controllers and new games. Um, but and if you're about writing policy. about copyright legislation or, or you know, uh, new new privacy court rulings, um, if you if you're not if you're not targeting basically based on something about the individual reader, um, it's a lot harder to figure out how to sell something um, or you know what to sell, what to try to sell. I mean, maybe legal reference books or something. Um, but well, but it's, it's sort of that kind of reporting is is a lot harder to find. That well, way. And so I think it's a fortunate sort of skew, maybe. That's, that's fair enough. And certainly when you open up your average Washington policy journal, like the Washington Monthly or the American Prospect, because all the ads seem to be aimed at people uh, over the age of 70 who read, <laughs> need really stupid, uh, who need big reading glasses or emergency, uh, emergency buttons to press, or else some sort of uh, cell phones that have uh, bright, big, easy to understand buttons that a, uh, that, you know, so, they're, so, so, so they're, they're clearly are skews and there there's a problem in getting an advertising model for uh, policy relevant stuff. But anyway, uh, uh, maybe we're drifting off a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, actually, want... The last thing on that is, is that I actually, I keep expecting to see like some kind of shift towards aspirational ad targeting. That is to say, I mean, like, well, you know, I think like a magazine or a website might want to, uh, you know, signal something about uh, about the demographic they hope to have, maybe not the one they actually have, and so you know, you have sort of lots of lots of uh, you know ads for whatever hep clothing lines or something, um, um, just so 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 people feel like you know they're they're not reading this and going, oh god, denture cream, what am I reading? Who, you know, who's the imagined audience here? Um, but anyway, but 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 yeah, let's let's uh, let's actually shift because because Susan Crawford, uh, the, the uh, legal scholar wrote, wrote an interesting blog post linking the that backdoor proposal that we were just discussing with uh, another proposal uh, uh, embedded in uh, legislation by, by Pat Leahy called the, the Combating uh, Online Infringement and Counterfeiting Act, uh, COICA, uh, which sounds uh, uh, eerily like cloaca, but uh, <laughs> I assume that's a coincidence. Um, um, what would hope, but, 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 but it's, it's a pretty accurate description. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, and so and this is again. I think maybe maybe we'll agree too much here, but but um, uh, the proposal there is is essentially to provide for court orders to uh, essentially direct internet service providers and, and DNS servers in the U.S. to uh, to essentially blacklist uh, or, or block or, uh, access to uh, websites, or not websites, whole domains basically that are believed to be you know, sort of significantly or primarily involved in, in hosting some kind of copyright infringing. Um, uh, content. I, I just, the, the title of the act actually, as I say, bothers me a little bit because it 
uh, as is so often the case in uh, uh, sort of debates about intellectual property, which is a huge basket term, um, counterfeiting, and, which, is, which is basically, I think, a kind of fraud, um, mm. right, I mean, sort of re- misrepresenting your product as something it's not, um, gets lumped together with uh, a bunch of other pretty discrete interests where different issues arise, different solutions are probably appropriate. But so this is uh, essentially a, a proposal for, for I think, a kind of massive sort of system of, of prior restraint that, that, that threatens, I think, to, to block all sorts of services that are that are used for both licit and illicit means. I mean, stuff like um, I don't know, rapid share and mega upload and all these uh, third-party sort of file hosts that lots of people store copyrighted and content on them, but are also used to host all sorts of legitimate content. Um, and, and actually, above and beyond that, there would be, I guess, a sort of optional attorney general's blacklist that, that ISPs would be encouraged to block uh, based on the attorney general's, uh, I guess, reasonable belief or something like that, very vague, um, that, that uh, the site was involved in, in I don't know, something, something shady. Um, and so that's, I mean, this is really depressing to me because yeah. back uh, in, in, you know, I used to do occasionally, you know, some TV, TV debate about uh, global internet freedom. So I would, you know, there'd be someone from China, um, and uh, and they'd be saying, um, well, you too in the U.S. you censor some content, you you know, you block child pornography and all these other things. And so, you know, what we're doing, you know, essentially censoring political dissidents is very similar. Um, and so, I mean, above and beyond the offensiveness of that comparison. Um, I could always say, well, no, it's not the same. We, you know, we have legislation that allows particular infringing content to be removed by court order, uh, but we don't have, uh, you know, essentially centralized filtering as part of our internet architecture. Uh, and that was the point Susan Crawford was making: is that what these have in common is that uh, these are attempts to pursue specific policy goals by using these architectural bottlenecks. Um, and, and, and using yeah. those as sort of an instrument of policy. Well, I think that's right, and it may be useful to add here that, uh, that, that Susan, until very recently, was a special advisor to the president on, uh, on technology-related issues, and I think the fact that she left the White House, uh, I don't know this from anything, per- but, but suggests perhaps some frustrations with the policy process that was going on. So this is something that she knows very intimately from a whole variety of different perspectives. But yeah, I think that that's basically right. And what we're seeing here is the, uh, you know, sort of, again, a recognition by the United States that there are these places that it can, it, it can basically hook into the, um, it can hook, it, it can, it can use, it can use certain choke points as a way of enforcing external policy. And I think what we're really seeing here, and maybe this is where both of these things comes to come together, uh, I haven't read the Crawford piece in question, is that this is all being driven in both cases, I think, by a more or less domestic agenda. You know, so when, you, when, we, when we talk about the, when we talk about the uh, proposal to basically uh, have a back door, you know, that this is, uh, this is a national security, homeland security type people. When we talk about the uh, proposal to uh, block uh, websites overseas, this is being driven uh, very clearly by the intellectual property lobby, which of course has its hooks into the uh, Democratic Party in a big way because, uh, because the Democratic Party gets a lot of funding from, from Hollywood. Right. And so, so but, but both of these are being driven purely domestically and personally, you know, so if I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not that perturbed by the targeting of uh, file sharing sites as such. I, I do think that there's some very legitimate purposes there. Uh, I also, you know, so I, 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 I don't, I don't particularly object to them being there. I don't particularly th- think that there's something which needs to be, uh, which need to be protected with an extraordinary degree of vigor. But it's a precedent that's being set here. Yeah. And if this precedent goes ahead, you know, so first of all, as you suggest, this is going to make the U.S. look a hell of a lot weaker to other countries when it's trying to persuade them that they need to uh, protect uh, civil liberties. And secondly, once this uh, barrier is crossed, you can see a lot of other ways in which the uh, in which this kind of power could be abused in some really pretty offensive and extraordinary ways. And I think a, a very good example here is to look at the uh, special 301 uh, uh, provisions of the, uh, you know, so this is basically uh, U.S. trade law, and these provisions which have been used systematically to target countries which have uh, intellectual property rights uh, regimes, which the U.S. considers to be counterproductive, and these intellectual property rights regimes may 
include things that are completely legitimate, such as uh, providing uh, cheap access to uh, medicines in uh, countries where in, co in countries where there are major health risks from AIDS or from other things. And the 301 uh, process has been used to target these countries uh, pretty effectively, pretty systematically. We've seen some work from uh, people like Sean Flynn at American University and others to try and uh, sort of turn the, this, the special 301 process against itself. But really what we see is that when you create these tools, they can, be, they can be used for very egregious purposes by special business interests within the U.S., and this can have very, very substantial problems for other countries, which uh, U.S. legislators don't particularly care about because U.S. legislators don't care about the world. And then, uh, as you say, it, it also dramatically weakens the efforts of, say, the uh, Department of State. If you look at Hillary Clinton's speech of a few months ago, where she was basically making, I thought, uh, what was actually a pretty good yeah. speech, you know, sort of a, a very good speech as uh, political speeches go in terms of the sophistication. Uh, this was not like her husband's speech of 10 or 11 years ago about, you know, sort of internet being, you know, sort of sliced freedom and uh, trying to stop it with, like, jello on the wall. It was a much more qualified speech about the kinds of things that internet freedom can or cannot do. But nonetheless, it is promoting a very clear message, and that message is going to look much, much muddier if you have uh, you, the U.S. effectively, deliberately, and selectively you targeting uh, offshore websites in order to uh, promote or protect its uh, it, it, the individual interests of uh, par powerful business groups within it. You know, I mean, I, 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 uh, uh, I have to say, uh, I. Uh, and you know, sympathetic in some extent as someone who I guess works works in a content industry himself. But the idea that you know, essentially you would you would propose to break the internet as a mechanism for uh, for you know guaranteeing the business model of, of I don't know, you know friends DVDs or something just seems like yeah. a, 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 a a cure so radically out of proportion to the harm it purports to prevent. I, I, incidentally, speaking of the, the the special 301, back again back when I was a a tech reporter. One of the one of the stories I was sort of happiest with was I, I, I did a sort of debunking of um, this sort of completely bogus statistics about the yeah um, that was cost of the of the U.S. copy uh, to the U.S. copyright industry of, of you know, various kinds of infringement. Can, can, can I just say that was one of the uh, I, I just actually was uh, flogging that story to a member of the European Parliament uh, oh. who I had to brief this morning. I'm re wearing a suit for the first time. I'm blogging as ever, <laughs> as, uh, and that was just a fabulous story, which I presume was one of the things that led to that uh, General Accounting Office report, which basically expo which basically confirmed uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat circumspectly that these figures were complete and utter bullshit, as you had reported. Yeah, I, th I think it may have even cited the story. I don't, I don't recall exactly now. But, but, uh, but one of the things I did note was that there actually was, back yeah. in like 1988 or 89, uh, an actual attempt by the, the Commerce Department, or maybe the U.S. Trade Representative's office, to, to actually produce a, a legitimate estimate. And it was, of course, a much smaller one. But when you looked at the methodology, um, it wasn't intellectual property theft that it was trying to measure. It was the results of uh, uh, the cost to the U.S. economy of insufficient protection, which includes theft, but also included stuff like uh, uh, overbroad uh, fair use exemptions uh, or, or insufficiently high deterrent penalties. And I was thinking, well, I mean, no, you're, you're, you are treating the public policy decisions of other countries when they differ from ours in a more permissive direction as, as, as you know, theft from U.S. companies yeah. somehow, um, which just seems to be kind of, kind of perverse. I mean, is it, uh, it's, it's a little bit taking <laughs> exceptionalism too far as to somehow we have this kind of platonic form of copyright law and if you if you strike a different policy balance, you know, well, you're you're you're, st you're costing us money, you're stealing from us. I mean, it seems kind of incredibly arrogant to me. Um, yeah. But you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a terrible rootless cosmopolitan, so do I. Know. Well, another another topic that I'm afraid we agree on pretty well, nearly completely. Well, let's see. So then, let's. I don't know if we can we can have something to fight about with with, with Stuxnet, but. Um, uh, the the this is interesting to me as someone who's I guess been always a little skeptical about about um, you know these sort of uh, overheated warnings about the coming cyber war. It always seemed to me that you know um, you would get these very dire warnings about about the threat of cyber war, often from you know former intelligence officials who either you know were getting a paycheck from or had gotten a paycheck from or were likely to again get a paycheck from someone like Booz Allen. 
um, who you know makes makes uh, mm. uh, a lot of scratch, uh, you know, essentially getting contracts that based on, on, on fears over this stuff. Um, but when you, you know, came down to actual cases of cyber war, they're like, well, you know, in Estonia, the government, you know, some of the government web pages got taken down, and you go, well, okay. Um, but but this Stuxnet, the Stuxnet worm, is actually uh, the first time something that actually looks like these sort of scare scenarios um, has actually been encountered in the wild, where where um, so as I understand, this is an incredibly sophisticated piece of software that basically, I mean, just reading the description of it, I, I agree, it's, this is something that, that really only, I think, could have been done by, by a, a nation state, and this is not some kids in their basement. Uh, it was a, a very sophisticated, highly targeted worm meant to, to target, uh, basically, infrastructure control systems. Um, uh, it, it included something like four or five zero-day explosions. I mean, this is unheard of. Yeah. Uh, they would have a single piece of software with that many zero day meaning of course is uh, uh, an, uh, an as a, a, pri a previously unknown unreleased and for that reason of course unpatched uh, uh, operating system vulnerability um, I mean so yeah I mean so this bears all the hallmarks of, of, of something done by a government um, most experts believe that it was actually meant to target uh, probably Iran. actually one specific nuclear facility probably in Iran uh, and that it and they're still actually not sure exactly what it was supposed to do when it when it found its target uh, or, or got the signal, uh, but it may well have been to, to basically cause, uh, you know, cause, cause uh, an overheat or some kind of actual physical catastrophe. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of looking at this and, and maybe, uh, I guess, ratcheting down maybe my, my, my sense that, that the, the hype over cyber war was, in fact, 90% uh, you know, hype. I think maybe, let's say now it's 60% uh, hype. I'd, I'd I'd go for an intermediary of seventy or eighty percent because you know the, one of the things that obviously is at least a plausible hypothesis is this could very well have been the U.S. government itself, including a bunch of the uh, you know sort of the, not necessarily the same people who've been out there uh, banging the drums about this stuff, but their former colleagues and people who also hope to be uh, you know sort of on the payrolls of Bruce Hamilton. Or other places. Uh, one of the, uh, and I'm sure you've seen this as well as somebody working this uh, field in DC, uh, over the last uh, 18 months or so, the amount of chancers trying to uh, make large amounts of money from literally billions of dollars that is out there for contractors on cyber security related things have been quite extraordinary. So, uh, but that said, it's uh, it does, at the very least, as a proof of concept, it shows that this kind of stuff can happen. And uh, and of course, there, you know, so it's it's an interesting question as to how many of the you know how many systems, these SCADA systems in the U.S., which are pretty common for a wide variety of different purposes, not only nuclear reactors but also you know, sort of more general control systems and factories and so on. How many of those are vulnerable? There, so, but I still think there's a there's a hell of a lot of hype out there. You know, so the the the, the quest uh, because. I guess the uh, the you know the uh, what I've seen and you know, so what what I've heard and this is mostly uh, gossip because the uh, real stuff is presumably happening within classified circles is that you have seen a fair amount of activity but most of that activity has been purely espionage type activity with occasional damage being caused as a kind of an a an accidental uh, byproduct of that somebody's messing around in the system looking for interesting stuff and they uh, type in the wrong command and something screwy happens as a result of that uh, the uh, whether or not there are the kinds of major vulnerabilities that you see, for example, in stupid Bruce Willis movies, I think is uh, still uh, very much an open question. So maybe, maybe, so let's just say I think this is a proof of concept. It's a proof of concept that stuff can happen. But if this was what people think it was, it was a very targeted proof of concept, which not only rely, uh, are a very targeted uh, operation, which not only presumably re uh, required these uh, several zero-day exploits to be incorporated, but also required some very specific uh, intelligence on the very particular systems that this uh, that uh, that this Iranian yeah. react reactor, if that was the target, actually had. Because without that information, uh, you simply would not have been able to do something. And this is all also the reason why nobody's quite sure what the hell this was supposed to do. Because there's a mysterious command there that nobody that 
because these systems tend to be so idiosyncratic, nobody nobody knows quite what it was supposed to do. And so the question is, uh, you would really have to have some uh, foreign power, which both had the uh, technological sophistication and the intelligence, the specific intelligence on which particular system was installed in which particular place, what vulnerabilities that system had, in order really to be able to pull, pull this off. So I think it's... And also, I mean, we're saying physical, physical access. I mean, it's no, I mean yeah. no one who's not crazy has their critical infrastructure control systems hooked up to the public Internet. So Although uh, I, I also need to be able to get it in a flash drive that was, that was sort of brought in by, a, uh, yeah. I think, a Russian contractor. Although I have heard horror stories about SCADA systems hooked into uh, open Wi-Fi. Uh, oh, God, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's about us. So we don't need a cybersecurity that. We just need, you know, someone to take a sap to the head of whoever did that. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, back, to, back to, you know, back to CSIP's uh, um, certification camp for you. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, guess the only other, as far as I know, documented example of a SCADA system being used for malicious purposes involved an engineer who was pissed off because he'd been fired, who knew the controls and was able, who knew all the controls and commands and was able to log in remotely and uh, try to flush uh, tons of stuff from a particular plant into the river. But again, you know, so you need to have, uh, you need to, to understand the system. And a lot of these systems, you know, so they're patched together year by year by engineers, you know, sort of, uh, trying to deal with these uh, very specialized problems, unless you have some very, very intimate knowledge of what kinds of software, what kinds of uh, tools have been installed, what kinds of uh, specialized hacks have been used to solve this or that little sort of problem, it's uh, very difficult to actually, uh, it's very difficult or so. People are more technically sophisticated than me tell me it's very sophisticated, to, it's very difficult to actually do something. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also, I mean, one point I think maybe worth making is, is, is also these, you know, these, these uh, very sophisticated sort of cyber attacks are, are you know, sort of like the ultimate nullifier in Marvel Comics. They're really a, a sort of one-shot weapon. They kind of destroy the yeah. They, they, they destroy the attack itself in the, in the process of being used because it's you know I mean you drop a bomb on someone they maybe they know you're dropping bombs but the next bomb uh, you know still blows up as well um, but something like this is incredibly labor intensive to produce um, the estimates I've seen say they really they must have had basically a team of you know half a dozen ten people working for something like six months on it um, just to do this one very targeted attack and it almost has to be targeted because again once it's sort of in the wild. Um, the utility of the of the of the attack is, is sort of compromised. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, now you know how to make sure it, it it's countered. A zero day exploit is only a, a zero day exploit on the zero day basis. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, um, so. Yeah, I think I, guess, I think I think that's right. Is there proof of concept? Proof that 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 uh, the the scary stories can happen. Um, but yeah, at the same time. Um, well, I mean, I think one of the problems is just that we've lumped so many different things. I remember watching a very frustrating uh, debate here at the museum a while back um, where um, I think, I think the Mitch, uh, not Mitch McConnell, Mike McConnell and, and John Zittrain were debating, uh, I think Bruce Schneier maybe, and, and, and Mark Rotenberg from Epic, and uh, yeah. it was about whether the cyber war threat has been overstated. And you realize that they're talking actually about this huge range of, I mean, they're talking about, the security of military communications networks. They're talking about, uh, you know, uh, you know, stuff like denial of service attacks. They're talking about U.S. critical infrastructure, physical systems. Uh, they're talking about stuff that sounds more like, uh, you know, frankly, uh, uh, sort of conventional or uh, industrial espionage uh, or, or, or hacking. And so there's this, this enormous kind of range of different types of problems. Some of which you really only would encounter in the context of. Uh, of an actual sort of uh, nation-state conflict, some of which um, are really basically just extensions of, of problems of computer crime, and all kind of lumped together under this rubric, and maybe it's convenient to, to sort of have one big word to talk about things an enemy power might do uh, in, in sort of the sort of cyber domain um, in, in a conflict, uh, but also kind of, I think, I think misleadingly suggests that these are all you know, somehow of a kind, you know, one kind of problem that requires some kind of unified, uh, you know, military footing sort of response, and, and that seems like sort of sneaking in a, 
uh, a dangerous assumption to me. Well, I think that's right, and part of this, of course, is because the debate has been primarily driven by people who want to uh, say that the sky is falling and want to identify anything that can plausibly be identified as a cyber attack as being a cyber attack, and uh, this can lead to some real problems. There is a, you know, if you look back to the uh, days of the Cold War, the 1960s, all of those creepy uh, studies done by Rand and uh, the work of Thomas Schelling uh, about you know, which kinds of nuclear attacks on uh, cities could be counted as being escalations, which is uh, basically just trying to communicate, uh, you better leave us alone or whatever. But nonetheless, the idea, the idea there was to create a commonly understood system of rules so that people would be able to figure out what was, uh, you know, so what was a real attack, what was not an attack, and hence to sort of dampen down uh, possible tensions which otherwise might lead to the uh, outbreak of full-on thermonuclear nuclear war. And uh, you don't have that kind of set of understandings here, and you have some people who are basically, I think, systematically trying to confuse those understandings because uh, that's where the commercial interest lies. There's a very uh, nice National Academy of Sciences report which came out at the end of last year. It's one of those, uh, I, I think it costs 80 or $90 or something, but there's a SEMISDAT version available on the web. And uh, more or less, I think the main basic message that they're trying to get across there is trying to distinguish between, on the one hand, uh, espionage-type operations, which governments engage in against each other systematically, and which is not usually considered to be a, a, a cause of war, and, you know, sort of more, um, sort of, you know, sort of more genuine attacks on uh, military capabilities or civilian uh, infrastructures or whatever, which could uh, lead to loss of life. And I think the very clear implicit message that they're trying to push here is uh, do not get these things confused when you're trying to come up with a basic, uh, a basic set of understandings about the strategy of uh, cybersecurity, because otherwise you're going to find yourself in some extremely messy and extremely dangerous situations uh, very quickly, especially if uh, cyber attacks start to become uh, seen as being a uh, means of waging warfare and as something to which one can retaliate with uh, conventional military responses. Yeah. No, I think, I, think, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that's nice in this debate is that, is that uh, um, uh, the, the kind of side that was arguing for the, the, the problem being overhyped was, was saying, look, you know, let's, let's be clear here. War, war is an enterprise in which people die. So uh, if, if, you, if, you, uh, if, you, if you can't sort of point to people who are, are, are somehow being killed as a result of uh, whatever's happening, um, you know, maybe find a less inflammatory term. Um, you know, I mean, it's terrible if the banking system is, is, is disrupted, um, but, but when, when, I mean, it depends on the sponsor, but um, but that's also the kind of thing that could happen as a result of, of uh, certainly non-nation state things. I mean, that's, that's just a problem. Um, and I, I, there's not an obvious reason to me that you would say, well, that it, you know, it's, it's somehow one kind of problem uh, depending on yeah. who's, who's doing the attack. Uh, and a different kind of problem if it's kids in a basement or a, 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 you know, some kind of criminal, criminal enterprise. Um, we have just a little bit of time left, I guess. So um, um, I think we, you wanted to talk about uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, most recent uh, excretion uh, in The New Yorker. <laughs> I sense a, a sudden fit of agreement coming upon us again. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell's glibness. Yes. Well, let me, let, me, let me talk specifically about this. The uh, problem, I think, with this article is not necessarily that it's wrong. Uh, the, uh, you know, well, more or less what he's doing is he's arguing that Twitter and similar forms of electronic communication make a lousy basis for, uh, social, uh, for, social, for uprest or for upheavals or for really costly forms of social action. And that's probably right, but it's the conventional wisdom that I think has developed around this stuff among pretty well everybody who uh, seriously studies it, and is supported in best Malcolm Gadwell fashion with a uh, smattering of, of uh, arguments taken from social science and a whole lot of anecdotes. And this is something that as somebody who studies this stuff uh, pisses the hell out of me, uh, uh, together with a couple of colleagues, uh, Mark Lynch, who is also a blogger, John Sides, who is also a, a co-blogger at the Monkey Cage, uh, Ethan Zuckerman at uh, Harvard, and John Kelly, uh, who's also at Harvard. We uh, have recently written a piece for the U.S. Institute of Peace, which is more or less uh, talking about the... Uh, talking about these issues of how it is that social media media can or cannot contribute to 
contribute to uh, uh, various forms of uh, political upheaval. And the basic conclusion that we reach is, uh, well, there are a lot of plausible arguments out, uh, out there, but nobody knows because nobody does serious research on this. Instead, what you get is uh, different versions of Malcolm Gladwell, an argument, an anecdote, and a, a punchline. And this is taken as being uh, serious evidence in, uh, to support one or another uh, policy proposal or policy solution. I think there is a, 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 a sort of burgeoning small literature, um, but, but yeah, no, that, 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 that seems right to me. I'm actually very curious to, to read this paper actually now. Um, but uh, the, the one thing I found striking was just the way uh, he talks about cyber activism as though it's somehow this discrete category. I mean, so on one hand, so first, you know, weak ties uh, uh, are, are, are kind of a necessary prerequisite to strong ties. He talks about, you know, the need to build these sort of protest organizations around strong ties. Um, and, but no, no tie is strong to start with. It's like, you know, you don't, you know, um, you, know you don't you yeah. know, have good friends until you're acquaintances. Um, but also just this weird sort of compartmentalization. I mean, you know, the, the, the uh, you mentioned Samizdat earlier, right? I mean, you know, sort of the, the Soviet dissidents who were circulating Samizdat were, were, taking advantage of this is the new prevalence of these mimeograph machines, but they weren't mimeograph dissidents. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's weird to me that somehow, I mean, I don't know what the, what, what kind of political organization or movement in 2010 was somehow not use uh, uh, the internet or, or digital tools as, as, as a mechanism. I mean, they should just, I guess, write letters. Um, I, 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 I mean, I, I guess I see the, the, the worry about you know, this sort of token, well, I, I, I posted a link on my Facebook page, um, <clears throat> you know, I did something like that, and now I feel like I've contributed, um, and so I don't really need to, so to the extent that there's really any kind of displacement, uh, you know, that, that, I guess that's a potential problem. Um, on the other hand, you know, when you talked about this need for sacrifice, I thought the whole kind of lesson of, of peer production and stuff like Wikipedia is, hey, stuff that used to require a massive investment from a small number of people, you know, the, the yeah. you know, couple hundred people you get to, to, to compile and get paid to work on an encyclopedia, um, you can actually do uh, without that if you can find a way to let, you know, a million people collaborate, even if only of them are, are, are making a very small contribution. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, it, obviously it's possible that, that for whatever reason, um, political uh, dissent or political change or agitation wouldn't work that way. I can, I mean, I can, off the top of my head, think of probably a better argument than, than Gladwell makes in that piece, actually, um, for why that might be the case. Um, I mean, actually, to sort of effect change, I suppose you need political actors to persuade it that, that um, there's sort of sufficient salience that uh, that you know behavior is actually going to change. Um, but I, I. Uh, 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 you know, he doesn't certainly make that argument anyway. He doesn't. He doesn't even seem to get into the, sort of the question of whether um, the, the, this is something that's similar or different in the political sphere. Um, I, yeah, well, I guess there are a couple of uh, you know. One thing that I think you get right there is his cluelessness about the ways in which. Uh, people actually have genuine, uh, strong ties relationships online in a way that they uh, didn't a number of years ago. And maybe because we both are bloggers, this is something we certainly, to give an example of it, uh, one of my co-bloggers and good friends was, is a guy called Scott McLemy. And, uh, and I got to know him first uh, via blogging, then via email. And I, I think we developed a pretty close uh, electronic friendship. But I assumed that he uh, lived in New York. And then I think after uh, two years of uh, correspondence, I found out that he lived five blocks away from me, just, just <laughs> over the circle. And so, you know, you have these weird electronically mediated friendships happening uh, without any idea, uh, you know, so you have no idea of where these people are geographically. You don't have any idea of what they look like. You know, so there's always this uh, kind of awkward weirdness for a few moments when you meet somebody who you know well online, uh, but you've never actually met in person until you can establish the rapport. But nonetheless, there's a real substantial strong ties relationship happening there. And I think that there is this mistake there uh, that uh, he, he makes of basically confusing the form 
uh, the, for, uh, you know, the format that the relationship is uh, conducted through with the actual content of the relationship. And, uh, you know, if this is true for me and I'm 40, I, you know, so if I think about what it's true for people in their late teens, early 20s, and what it's going to be like for my kids when they grow up to that stage, as so much of people's lives is being conducted electronically. Now, that said, uh, clearly, I'm sort of, uh, there are many ways in which electro, you know, so merely I'm sort of coloring your Facebook page green in sympathy with Iranian pro protesters is probably going to do diddly squat. But you can also get people to really engage in uh, political action. And this is something, again, which research that I and others have done have shown, that people who uh, are engaged in various forms of online networks are more likely to uh, give money, are more likely to uh, try to uh, sort of talk to candidates, are more likely to do a whole bunch of things. And this is, of course, what the Obama campaign did. If you talk to Joe, Joe Rosper's or people, they basically said, on the one hand, pure Facebook activity didn't do very much for them. On the other hand, you know, so it provides a, um, sort of a very niche network in which they can actually get people to organize their social networks around doing stuff, and that these tools can again um, sort of produce lasting and meaningful real-world political action. And this is something which, you know, uh, I guess Gladwell's, you know, he, he strikes me as being a smart guy, but somebody who is, uh, he's too in love with, you know, sort of the glib revealing anecdote, which supposedly uh, gives you the key to the world, and not really interested in the actual mechanisms and the complexity of those mechanisms. Yeah, I, you know, in my experience, I've in the past interviewed, uh, uh, again, sort of my, my journalist life, interviewed various people who are sort of serious uh, uh, academics, people doing research on the, the mathematics of, of, of small world social networks, and it just invariably, um, you know, they were just, they were just really or... frustrated because they go, no, he gets he gets the details completely wrong, and the details are sort of everything. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I just to to actually spin off slightly tangentially uh, into a uh, my my just my own tooth fairy dreams about about uh, how this actually, actually you reminded me first that I mean I think actually one of the original I mean it's one of these classic social science findings that like. If you get someone to make a kind of small, trivial commitment, they actually that opens the door, that sort of creates a foot in the door effect, and it's easier to get them to make a more substantial commitment later. The actual experiment that sort of is always cited as, as supporting that conclusion, if I'm remembering right, it involved uh, basically political campaigning. It was, it was if funnel. you could get someone to yeah to put like a little tiny sticker on their window or something. Um, once they had done that, you came back a week later and asked to put this sort of enormous garish campaign sign in the middle of their lawn. They were much more likely to, uh, to having made that little commitment, um, agree to, to help in a way that, that you know, they, they otherwise would not have. Um, oh, but, and, and, and just, I, I was, I think, what I'm really actually waiting to see, um, because I actually think it's less the case, the sort of nobody knows you're a dog phenomenon. I mean, I feel like I, me, I, it's, it's very common, it's almost becoming, I think, the point where it's, it's uh, more common than not that I'll meet someone and, you know, someone will say, oh, yeah, that's Dr. John Boy G on Twitter. You know, that, you know, introduced them by the Twitter handle. I'm probably, I'm already vaguely conscious of them. I might kind of recognize them from their avatar. I probably, you know, have some vague sense of what, you know, bars they patronize. Um, because, there, you know, there are these sort of physical clusters to the way people interact online. Um, I'm really interested in the way stuff like augmented reality will, I think, facilitate the kind of in-the-world activism that... Um, that uh, Gladwell wants to see more of. I mean, I think it would be really interesting if someone who has on Facebook expressed, um, you know, an interest in labor rights, let's say, uh, finds that when they go out and they have a kind of augmented reality overlay on the world, um, will, you know, have a pop-up that says, you know, the um, restaurant you're bad about to patronize has really appalling labor practices. Um, or the, you know, the shaving cream that you're about to pick up off the supermarket shelf was tested on animals. I mean, it's the kind of thing where, where yeah. even people who care often just aren't willing to do the kind of investment uh, uh, in, in, you know, sort of researching everything they buy and every business they patronize. But I, I just wonder how many people there are out there. I expect there's a huge number um, who would actually be willing to change, change their behavior to support, you know, better labor practices, better treatment of animals or, uh, you know, uh, non-support of, of, of uh, other causes they dislike, um, if, it, if it almost uh, came to them unbidden, if merely by, exp you know, expressing the concern, they would almost already automatically know what kind of personal or, or consumer choices uh, would, would actually enact those values.
Yeah, that's uh, fascinating. And of course, you see a whole lot of people, Sunlight Foundation and others, trying to get mm -hmm. that kind of information out there. But as you say, when it becomes apps of one sort or another that are augmented, that, that basically feed into your daily uh, flow, you can imagine that having some pretty significant consequences. And of course, as a social scientist, you know, every social scientist, I think, is like, what's his name in The Simpsons, Dr. Marvin? Do you remember the guy who wants to uh, grow a, um, you know, he wants to buy a baby so that he can grow it in a uh, isolated uh, container to see what happens? Right. And you know, so, uh, this kind of stuff brings out my inner Dr. Marvin. It makes me uh, think, uh, okay, Dr. Marvin Monroe. From the yeah, Simpsons, the Dr. Right? Marvin Monroe, exactly. It makes me think, okay, you could do, you could do all sorts of fun things by providing people with different inf informational stimuli and then in controlled experiments seeing actually how this uh, reshapes the ways in which people uh, do things in the world. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually working on building a combination bassinet and Skinner box uh, for, when, for when I have kids. Um, so, uh, you know, happy to, happy to share my data. In a, in, a, in a transparent way. Well, I, I remember um, Dr. Marvin Monroe, you know, so the hypothesis he was going to test, I think, was that the, uh, was that the infant who was brought up in the Skinner box would uh, feel uh, anger and resentment, so I guess. <laughs> Story checks out. Uh, well, you know, they say libertarianism is dead, but we've just spent uh, we just spent an hour basically agreeing. Um, I, I, I wish I feel like I'm sorry. I'm sorry, internet people, that we could not uh, uh, provide more pugilism. I, next time, I'll just we'll meet in person and uh, and and kickbox. Uh, uh, I, I, or jello yeah. wrestle. I think you'd take me. I think you'd take me. I, th I, I think the internet, even if we end up agreeing, probably works out better for us. I mean, <laughs> I'm probably in worse shape than you think. Um, anyway, it was a great conversation. Uh, uh, goodbye out there. Uh, hello, NSA. Um, and uh, catch you next time. Okay. Talk to you soon.